I don't know how to unclick, so I'll just introduce them. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. And today's guest is doing lots of great things in the world. He works tirelessly on behalf of people for human health, animals, and the planet. He's been on the show before, but I can't believe it's been almost a year. He's the founder and president of PCRM, which stands for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. If you haven't checked it out, please do. And if you ever have to give a donation in anybody's honor, like mine, for example, please, that is one organization that you can trust that your money is going to be put to really, really good use. Please welcome Dr. Neil Barnard, who's going to talk about foods that help fight hot flashes. So good to see you again. You too, AJ. I hope the world's treating you well. It is. You look amazing, by the way. You look fit and tan and like the, the boy from Ipanema, the doctor from Ipanema. <laughs> hey, never as amazing as you, AJ. <laughs> you, are, you are always my role model. Oh my God, thank <laughs> you. Well, now, Dr. Bernard, why are you so interested in, in what you're talking about now? Hormonal balance, hot flashes. Why, why is that of such interest to you at this point? Well, we've, I think we've turned a corner in health and nutrition. The old idea was you eat something bad and you'll gain weight. You eat something bad and your cholesterol goes up. And that's all sort of true, except we now know that hormones affect everything in your body. And foods can change your hormones. They can make them uh, more concentrated or less concentrated. And that's not just true for insulin, which is the hormone that we're talking about diabetes. Um, it's not just true for thyroid hormone, which controls your energy level, but it's true for things like estrogens and testosterones and all down the line. So I thought, how many people actually know how to control their hormones? How do they know how their breakfast or lunch is going to affect it? And so I wrote a book called Your Body in Balance, and it's kind of an owner's manual to, to reaching a new level of health. At least that's my hope. Do you think that the majority of the people that are eating animal products every day and consuming dairy even realize that they're eating hormones? I'm sure they have no idea. Uh, and they're, they're not gonna be on the label. Um, in, uh, if you buy a carton of milk, it doesn't say this contains estradiol that came out of the cow, but it does. And that's true of every scoop of ice cream and every cup of yogurt and so forth. But no, they, they don't have any idea. And so that's the reason that people like you and me have to um, do what we do to get the word out so that people can make some better choices. It'd be great if there was truth in labeling and meat and dairy could be labeled for what it really was. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. Um, but I think people are starting to understand more and more about it, particularly since there are pressures, not just with regard to being kind to animals and being kind to your coronary arteries, but the health of the planet is sort of hanging in the balance too. So I think there's a lot more urgency to the message now. Yeah, the time has come. I know you've presented a wonderful presentation for us. So if you'd like to share it, we'd love to see it. Well, in that case, let me jump in. We are gonna talk about one of the most neglected topics and that's the menopausal trans the transition, which for many women, they go to the doctor and the doctor just says, let me patch on the head, you know, eventually you'll get over it. Or here are some drugs that have serious side effects and women are wondering, wait a minute, there has gotta be something better. So let me share that with you. Great, this is a very timely topic. Okay. Um, What are the changes that occur when a woman reaches menopause? First of all, what's happening is the ovaries decide, you're 52 years old now, this is not a good time to have a toddler on your kitchen floor. Uh, let's like, close the reproductive window. And so the ovaries come to a stop. And what that, when that happens, hormones change. Estrogen falls, that's estradiol and progesterone falls. And so the way you feel it is hot flashes. It can be vaginal changes. It can be mood changes where you feel like this just isn't me. And so let's start with number one, which is the thing that bugs so many women when they're approaching 50 or between 50 and 60. And, and the problem is really vasodilation. A hot flash means that the blood vessels in your skin suddenly widen out. And when they do that, they release heat. So you're sitting in a boardroom you're in the middle of a meeting and all of a sudden it's 150 degrees. And then about two minutes later, it all goes away. And now you're left with, with sweaty clothes and chills and you feel terrible. And it can happen at night and it can wake you up multiple times, leaving you feeling crummy in the morning. And so what it's like is somebody really turning on a radiator in your skin. So what do we do about it? Well, the first clues 
that food might have anything to do with this came from Japan. Researchers in Canada, where they have a lot of hot flashes, just like in the United States, went to Japan and they started interviewing Japanese women, lots of them, more than a thousand. And they discovered that hot flashes were reported by only about 15% of women. And when they had them, they were really mild and they didn't even have a word for hot flashes. It just was an inconsequential thing. And same was true in China. Uh, researchers went to China and they found that hot flashes were maybe 15% or less of women and really not a big deal. And so the first explanation for what was going on was the soybean, soybeans, uh, miso soup, tofu, soy milk, tempeh, all of these foods that come from soybeans, which have been consumed in China and Japan and their neighbors for centuries and centuries, they are healthy foods and delicious foods, but they also contain isoflavones. Isoflavones are natural compounds that are like anti-hot flash medicine. And here are their names. This will not be on the test, but this is, this is what they look like. Genistine, Dadezine, and Glycetine. So, okay, but wait a minute. Something happened in Japan. In about the 1990s, 2000s, the rice-based diet became a burger diet a lot more. In other words, um, fast food chains came in. And people could go to McDonald's, which they couldn't have before. And there was KFC and all these places bringing in much more meat, much more uh, chicken, more fish even, uh, and dairy products, which were not part of the Japanese tradition, became a big thing. And unfortunately, hot flashes then started going way, way up to over 40% of women started having them. Still not as bad as the United States, but much more common than before. So what's that about? Well, researchers looked first, they thought maybe women aren't having soy anymore, but that wasn't it. If you look at soy, over the years from the 60s to 2000, it's about the same. But the percentage of the diet that soy has been dropping, meaning something else is coming in and crowding the soy a bit. What would that be? Well, here is a research study that looked at what came in. More meat, more eggs, more fish, and more dairy products. That big dotted line that's soaring up there, that's milk cheese, and it came in in a huge way. Well, what are they replacing? They're replacing rice. Rice fell out of fashion. Grains in general, potatoes. These healthy plant-based foods are being replaced by animal-based foods. So what this shows us is it's not just soy. The soy isoflavones seem to be part of why Japanese women did well, but there's more to it because as they were changing their diet, keeping the soy but having more animal products, hot flashes became a big thing. Something about the overall, overall diet. And we get another clue. Let's go to Cancun. Let's get off of the airport. Let's get a rental car. Let's drive two hours west. And if you do, you'll end up in a little town called Valladolid. And right next to it is one called Chichimila. And these are Mexican towns where there are lots of people who are from a Mayan tradition and still eat a lot of Mayan traditional foods. And researchers interviewed more than 100 postmenopausal Mayan women. And they found something really fascinating. None of them had any hot flashes. <laughs> they, they would interview them and say, when you, were, when you were going through the change, did you break out in a sweat? Did you get really hot? No, they didn't know what you're talking about. This, this didn't occur to them. Well, what are they eating? Okay, they're not eating rice. This is not a Japanese diet. They, but they do eat a grain. It's not rice, it's corn. Okay. And they eat beans, but it's not soybeans, is it? It's black beans. That's the Mayan tradition. And they eat vegetables. This is a vegetable called la chaya. And they eat lots of vegetables, at least traditionally. Now, as you can imagine, the changing dietary habits and increasing fast food and junk, it's coming in there just like everywhere else. But what we learned from these studies is that when people are on traditional plant-based diets, they don't really have much in the way of hot flashes. And it might be the soy in Japan, but it's probably more than that. It seems to be the diet overall. So it looks like if women change their diet, maybe their hot flashes can improve. Maybe so. A really large study, the Women's Health Initiative, brought in more than 17,000 women and they reported their vasomotor symptoms, vasomotor, 
hot flashes is what that means. Now, they were between 50 and 79 years of age. They weren't taking hormones at all. And they gave them a diet. They said, how about this? We're not going to do exactly a Japanese diet. We're not going to do quite a Mayan diet, but let's cut the fat at least. Let's have more fruits, more vegetables, no whole grains. This was not vegetarian, but it was kind of trudging along in a more plant-based direction. And what they showed is that if you looked at who was more likely to be free of hot flashes a year later, if you lost weight from this healthy diet change, that increased your odds of being free of hot flashes by 23%. Okay, weight loss is good. And just the diet change alone, even if you didn't lose weight, increased your odds by about 14%. Okay, not super impressive, but it does show that something about a diet change is gonna help women. If, the, if they just change their diet alone, and especially if they lose a little bit of weight from it, that's good. So they said, all right, the dietary intervention seemed to alleviate, uh, ameliorate the symptoms above the effect of the weight change. All right, so we're getting somewhere. But then a researcher named Bonnie Beasold said, well, what about vegans? How do they do? And she looked at vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes in a group of omnivores, compared them to the vegans. And as you can see here, the vegans had a lot less hot flashes. At least that was in the perimenopausal period. A lot fewer physical problems too. Now in the postmenopausal period, the changes weren't so dramatic, but I think that's because she included women up to age about 80, where everything is kind of equaling out a little bit. Okay, so looking plant, going plant-based seems to be helpful, but the plot thickens. We talked about soy being maybe helpful. We talked about the overall diet being helpful. But let me introduce something else, and that's your gut. You've heard people talk about this. What you eat affects your gut microbiome. The bacteria that make their home in your digestive tract. They can be kind of maladjusted bacteria that are making your life miserable. Uh, I'm talking about gut symptoms and making you feel a lot of sorts mentally and everything. Or you can have healthy gut bacteria and the difference really has to do with what you eat. And the healthy bacteria, the healthy gut microbiome that came from your healthy plant-based diet will alter these magical soy isoflavones. They'll make them supercharged. Here's what I'm talking about. Okay, so remember back at the beginning, we said soybeans have isoflavones. One of them is called datezine. And the datezine is in your digestive tract because you just ate some tofu or some soybeans or some soy milk. And now your gut bacteria say, oh, this datezine came out of the soybeans. Let me change that into something called equal. And the equal goes into the bloodstream and that is supercharged anti-hot flash medicine. So it's the combination of the soybeans having these nice chemicals and your plant-based diet that gave you a healthy gut bacteria, healthy gut bacteria that can now turn those into what are really effective medicine. So it's this combination of the soy and the healthy diet. So the question is, what about you? Does your gut microbiome do this conversion, can it make this magical uh, equal that can knock out hot flashes? I don't know. In Western adults, not very likely. Only 20 to 30% have the healthy gut bacteria that'll do it. Now in Japan, it's a lot more. 50 to 60% do it. And at first, I got to tell you, people thought, well, it's genetic. Asians have a gene for producing this. I want to tell you something that has nothing to do with genes at all. And then they thought, well, it's because they're consuming so much soy that their, their, their bacteria just decide they've got to convert it. It doesn't do that either. You can take a Western adult and give them soy all day long, and most of them still don't produce that pork. It's their plant-based diet. In Asian countries, they eat a lot more plants, a lot more fiber, and that sustains healthy gut bacteria and allow them to do this conversion. So in Australia, researchers looked at non-vegetarians compared them to vegetarians. And all be darned, it was the same thing. The non-vegetarians, only 25% produced that qual. In the, in the vegetarians, it was about 59%. And in the United States, same story. They did a short test, small test of a group of vegans. Among the non-vegetarians, nobody produced that qual. In the vegans, it was about 40%. So what we're getting at is that if you consume soy products, they may not really work for you very well unless you're on a healthy diet that has the gut bacteria that allow them to work really well. Okay, so to make this equal, which comes out of the soybeans in the form of dates and is then converted by your gut bacteria, you need a high carbohydrate diet. That means sweet potatoes, rice, starchy vegetables, beans, 
fruits and get away from the fat. Fat means dairy, meat, and greasy stuff. So researchers in Ireland brought in research participants and they said, I wonder if we could get them making Equal. And what they found is that to do it, they had to get the fat out of their diet and bring in the carbohydrate, more plant-based foods. Okay, now something disturbing has been happening in Japan. Researchers have been looking at young people, athletes. And what they found in Osaka, they looked at 28 athletes, I'm sorry, 88 college athletes, and only 30% of them were Equal producers, meaning they didn't have the healthy gut bacteria that their parents had had and that their grandparents and great grandparents had had. Why did only 30% of them have a healthy gut bacteria? Well, before answering that question, the researchers also noticed that if they weren't producing equal, if they didn't have a healthy gut bacteria, they were three times more likely to have impaired athletic performance, especially related to PMS and cramps and, and feeling bloated. So what we think has happened is these young Japanese diets, uh, young Japanese athletes were consuming diets that they were emulating from America, meat and dairy, thinking, well, I'm an athlete, I probably need more protein, I probably need milk, and that's destroying their gut bacteria and damaging them, damaging them, damaging them. Okay, that's all the bad news. Here's the good news. You can change your gut bacteria really fast. Um, this is Stephen O'Keefe's work in Pittsburgh. He brought in a group of men who were from Pittsburgh and a group of men from rural South Africa. And he said, okay, guys, swap your diets. So the guys from Pittsburgh started eating a rural South African diet. That means root vegetables and beans and very little meat. And the people from South Africa who were eating root vegetables and beans and very little meat started eating a Pittsburgh diet of chicken wings and fried fish and burgers and pizza. And their gut bacteria changed. They just exchanged. The people in Pittsburgh started having a healthier gut bacteria the people in rural South Africa that had been healthy started getting the unhealthy bacteria. How long did it take? 14 days, two weeks to change your gut bacteria. Very, very fast. Okay, so that's the scientific background. Here's my best guess that we're gonna now put to the test. I'm gonna say my hypothesis to treat hot flashes, soybeans can help you because they provide isoflavones, these magical anti-hot flash almost medicines that are right in the soybean. I'm gonna avoid the animal products and I'm gonna minimize oils because if I do that, that's gonna help me lose weight, which seems to be good. And it's gonna help me with my isoflavone conversion. All right, soybeans, no animal products, minimizing oils. Oh, by the way, I can hear you thinking. You're saying, wait a minute, soybeans, aren't there dangerous to soybeans? Isn't there something about what is the, hold that thought. I'm gonna come back to that. We're gonna address that in detail in just a little bit. Okay. but. This hypothesis is that this triad, soybeans, no animal products, minimize oils, might be the solution to hot flashes. Well, here's what happened. In 2020, just as the pandemic was getting started, I was traveling around the country because I had a new book called Your Body and Balance. And a reader called me up and said, Dr. Barnard, I read Your Body and Balance. And the menopause chapter uh, said, here's how you can knock out hot flashes. And it, it gave this hypothesis. And she said, my hot flashes were gone in five days. She said she read the book, she read the menopause chapter, and she put this to work and her hot flashes were gone in five days. Now I thought, wait a minute, I didn't promise. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought this would help, but I didn't promise that it would be quite that fast. So I asked her, how exactly did you interpret what I wrote in your body and balance? And she said, I just did what you said. Um, I was totally vegan, uh, very, very low in fat, and I had whole soybeans. And when she said that, I gotta tell you, a light bulb went off in my head. Because when I was describing this, I was talking about all kinds of soy products. Um, tofu, soy milk, edamame, miso. They're all good, they're all healthy. But when you're sitting at a Japanese restaurant, popping open those little edamame pods, those are juvenile soybeans. If you let them stay on the vine a little longer, as they mature, something happens. They make more and more and more of these healthy isoflavones. So the, the whole mature soybean has a whole lot more isoflavones than you'll find in tofu, soy milk, or edamame. So when she said that's what she was eating, the whole soybeans, I thought, bingo, this is what I want to test. So what did I do? Um, 
she said she used Laura brand. I'm going to tell you all the specifics. Laura brand non-GMO soybeans. She stuck them in an instant pot. She had a half a cup a day. So we began a study called the Women's Study for the Alleviation of Vasomotor Symptoms, the WAVES trial. We brought in postmenopausal women into our study. This started last September. And half of them did the diet, healthy diet. The other half did nothing, just stayed on their usual way of eating. And the diet intervention was 12 weeks and it was no animal products, low oil, half a cup of soybeans. Okay, this is sounding familiar and it's sounding pretty doable. Um, this is a diagram you might be familiar with, the power plate. It says, eat these things, fruits, grains, vegetables, and legumes. Legumes meaning beans, peas, lentils, and of course, soybeans. And you do need B12 for healthy nerves, healthy blood. That was the dietary intervention. And we tracked everybody's hot flashes on an app called MyLuna, where you just punch a button and it starts recording your hot flashes. And the frequency, intensity, the duration, whether day at night, at day or at night, we were able to really track them carefully. And because we did the study during the pandemic, we sent everybody a digital self-calibrating scale so we knew exactly how much they weighed, which is really handy. And everybody got an instant pop if they didn't already have a pressure cooker. And the whole idea was cook up your own soybeans at home and we're gonna do this for 12 weeks. Okay, what did we find? Well, the first thing we found was when everybody was stood on their digital scale, the control group, the people who didn't make any change, they didn't lose any weight. That's the red line here. They, they actually gained a little bit. And that's what happens. In September, people kind of start gaining weight. September, October, November, December, you know the drill. Um, and so they gained a little bit of weight, um, about 1.8 pounds on average. Now, what about the people on the vegan diet? They lost almost eight pounds. They're not counting calories and they're not exercising, but the average person lost about almost eight pounds. And that's what we've come to expect when people go on a plant-based diet. Now, some of these women were already skinny and they didn't get any thinner, but some were quite overweight and they lost a lot of weight, but the average was not quite eight pounds. Okay, but how about hot flashes? When we looked at all the hot flashes put together, they dropped in both groups, um, but especially the diet group, they dropped from more than six a day to about one a day, but here was where the money was. When we looked at the hot flashes that really bug you, the ones that are moderate to severe in intensity, they were in the, in the diet group about almost five a day at the beginning. And as the weeks went by, they dropped to less than one per day. And even more exciting than that, uh, that was a drop of 84%, really good, okay? But even more exciting than that, when we looked at who, was, who had any moderate to severe hot flashes at all? At the beginning, everybody had them. After 12 weeks, only about 40% of people, women had any moderate to severe hot flashes. The other 60 were completely free of the troubling hot flashes. In the control group, no big change. Okay, something is happening in a serious way with this diet change. It's knocking out the hot flashes and the side effects are healthy weight loss. Everything good is happening. Okay, well, let's go further. All right, vasomotor symptoms, that's hot flashes. They're knocked down in the diet group, great. Control group, a little benefit, not much. Psychosocial changes, like, do you feel like yourself? Much improved in the diet group, not so much the control group. How about physical changes, about headaches and aches and pains? Much improved in the diet group, not so much the control group. Sexual changes, um, the sexual symptoms of menopause are troubling to a lot of women greatly reduced in the diet group, not so much the control group. All right, as you can imagine, for the women who signed up for the study, this was a life-changing experience. They had come in a little skeptical about vegan diets, but eager to at least try it and see how it would work for them. But the benefits they got were far beyond what many of them expected. And I gotta tell you, their family members started seeing what was happening, adopting it for themselves and other people that they knew um, were really intrigued and inspired to improve their health too. Now you might be asking, wait a minute, if you were looking carefully, you notice that the control group was getting a little better too, despite the fact that they weren't changing their diet, they, or at least they weren't supposed to. Why did they do better? The short answer is, I don't know, but there are some possibilities. The first is menopausal symptoms just do improve over time for, for women in general. 
and it was a 12 week study. So maybe one or two got better for that reason. Um, the second thing is we started the study in September and we stopped it in December. So it's getting cooler and maybe that cooled down some of the hot flashes. But I gotta tell you the third thing, we asked the women not to change their diet, but they all knew that this was a vegan study. And they knew that our hypothesis was that a vegan diet would help them. And we also sent the controls an instant pot too, and a scale just to be fair. So I'm hoping they didn't actually change their diets at all, but I can't quite guarantee that. So anyway, the control, the control group did get a little bit better, but nothing like the, the diet group where we had an 84% drop in moderate to severe hot flashes. In a nutshell, this works. Okay, so what's the conclusion of this study? Well, it's that this combination of a low fat vegan diet plus daily soybeans causes substantial weight loss and it reduces the frequency of hot flashes. And it also just makes your whole quality of life a whole lot better. Okay, so I want to go a little bit further. Earlier, I hinted at the, that we need to talk about soy and breast cancer, because if you go on the internet and you search soy cancer, you'll find a lot of kind of paranoid sounding verbiage saying soy is going to kill you. And what they'll say is it's genetically modified stuff that's going to hurt you. Well, there are some things here to tackle. Let's unpack it just really quickly. When I go home to where I grew up, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. You ever been there? No? <laughs> See the movie? A good movie for sure. Okay, there you go. Well, that's where I grew up. When I fly into Hector Airport and I drive down the highway, all the way on this side of the highway, it's soybeans. Beautiful fields of soybeans. As far as the eye can see, all identical. Every plant is just like the next one because they're genetically modified organisms. If they are GMO soy. And you know what? You're not going to eat one bit of it. No human is because that's cattle feed. All over the Midwest, there are soy crops and corn crops that are GMO and no human is going to eat any of it. It's cattle feed, it's hog feed, and it's chicken feed. And so who is eating the GMO stuff? It's the animals who end up being meat in the, in the meat counter. Now, but you go to the store and you pick up a pack of tofu and you see the word organic written on there, or you get some soy milk and it says organic too. And by law, it can't be GMO. Okay, all right. So you can avoid the GMO stuff really easily. Um, all the organic soy is non-GMO and it's written right on the label, it's not GMO. But wait a minute, isn't there something about those soy, what is it, those isoflavones, those phytoestrogens, don't they cause cancer? Well, researchers discovered decades ago that soy isoflavones do attach to estrogen receptors. And at first, everybody held their breath. They said, wait a minute, does that mean it's gonna cause cancer? All right. 2008, researchers published an important study. They looked at eight prior studies, crunched all the numbers together, and they looked at people who consumed almost no soy, and they looked at people who consumed a lot of soy. I'm talking about uh, Asians and Asian Americans where tofu and soy milk were a big part of their tradition. And what they found was that those women who consumed the most soy had a 29% reduction in their likelihood of ever getting breast cancer. Wait a minute. That's the opposite of what you read on the internet, isn't it? Where you think soy is supposed to cause cancer. It's, it's, it's doing the opposite. Soy is reducing cancer risk. Soy seems to be helping to prevent breast cancer. Not in just one study, but in all, but in all eight of these studies. Wait a minute. What if a woman had cancer already and she goes to see her oncologist and the oncologist says, I don't know, I read something that maybe soy is not a good thing for you. Don't have any soy because you had breast cancer. Well, researchers found that that was a mistake because when you track women who have had cancer in the past, this is a combination of five different studies of women, all of whom had cancer in the past. They'd all been diagnosed with breast cancer. Those women who avoided soy products had the highest mortality, that's the red bar. Those women who consumed a lot of soy had much lower risk of dying of their cancer. That's the yellow and green bar, the yellow bar is the women who had previously been diagnosed with an estrogen receptor negative breast cancer. Their risk of ever dying of their cancer was cut by 25 to 30% if they were in the high soy group. The green bar is the women who had had a diagnosis in the past of an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And if they consumed a lot of soy products now, their risk of dying of their condition was cut by what, 25 to 30%. So, the well-meaning but ill-informed oncologist who says, I wouldn't need any soy, is condemning women to being in that red bar group. That's the highest mortality group. So 
now a lot of authorities are saying to prevent cancer, include some soy in your diet every day. And if you've had cancer, do the same. Okay, um, all right, let's try to understand why this would be. As I mentioned, soy isoflavones, all of these will attach to an estrogen receptor. Then why do they prevent cancer? Well, it turns out you've got two different kinds of estrogen receptors. The estrogen receptor alpha is in the breast, uterus, estrogen receptor beta, especially in bone, the urogenital system, and in your blood vessels. Where do the isoflavones attach preferentially? Beta. Aha. So the isoflavones are not like the estradiol that you might get from a cow in, in some cheese or something like that, or that your own, or in, that your own body might make. Those are the ones that are associated with cancer because they attach preferentially to estrogen receptor alpha. Uh -uh. The isoflavones attach to beta. And it's just like in your car, you got the gas pedal that makes things go fast. You got a brake right next to it that makes things go slower. Isoflavones, soybeans, they are the brake on cancer. Okay, you with me now? So the whole idea is that to, to reduce the risk of breast cancer, soy is a good friend. You don't have to have it, it's totally optional, but it doesn't cause cancer, it does the opposite. Now you might think, well, wait a minute, if I got hot flashes, why not just take estrogens? I mean, I can get a prescription and in half an hour waiting at the drugstore, they'll give me all the estrogens I need. Well, okay. Along with your prescription comes the prescribing information and you can read what happens. It says, if you're taking just an estrogen alone that your doctor would prescribe, it causes a higher risk of endometrial cancer, stroke, and deep vein thrombosis, and everyone's favorite, dementia. Now, if you have a uterus, your doctor is gonna say, well, I can't give you this because this is too dangerous. I'm gonna give you uterine cancer if I give you this. So they'll give you a combination of an estrogen plus a progestin. And that is linked to breast cancer, stroke, deep vein thrombosis, dementia, and myocardial infarction. In other words, heart attack. All of these are risks in, in big, bold print on the prescribing information. And so if you go to the doctor and you say, all right, um, let me take this and it'll knock on my hot flashes. The estrogens do, they do reduce hot flashes dramatically, but the doctor is gonna get nervous about prescribing them for very long for exactly these reasons. Is this true? Do these things really cause breast cancer? Well, in 2019, The Lancet published a big meta-analysis where they looked at hormone replacement therapy and they combined 58 prior studies and put all their data together. And it was a huge study, it included more than 100,000 cases of, of breast cancer. And what did they find? If you had used it for just a year or two or three, but not more than four years, the risk of breast cancer would go up by about 17% if you're taking an estrogen and up by 60% if you're taking the estrogen progestin combination. Yikes. Well, what if you use it for longer than that? Like five years. The estrogen only 33% risk combination more than 100% risk. In other words, your risk is doubled. Uh -huh. Okay. So if you use it for five years and if a doctor prescribes estrogen, He's going to have one case of breast cancer for every 200 prescriptions he writes. And for every combined estrogen progestin prescription he writes, out of every 50 women, one woman is going to get breast cancer as a result of the intervention he prescribed. And if it's 10 years of use, it's about double that. In other words, every 25 women who fills a prescription, one of them is going to get breast cancer specifically because of this treatment. Um, the meta-analysis concluded that in Western countries, there have been about this here. About 20 million breast cancers diagnosed since 1990, of which about a million would have been caused by menopausal hormone therapy use. Okay, so not good. However, a little bit of good news. Let's say you're a woman who's saying, okay, you knocked out my hot flashes with the soybeans and vegan diet, that's great, but I'm having some sexual symptoms still. I've got some vaginal dryness and intercourse is painful. Um, in that case, don't take the oral pills, the oral hormone pills. If you're using the hormones, use just a cream that is just used locally. That's all you need. You don't need something that's systemically absorbed to any substantial degree. And there doesn't seem to be any risk from the local creams. Okay, so back to the prescribing information. Um, what they will say 
is that estrogens with or without progestins should be prescribed at the lowest effective doses and for the shortest duration of time. Okay, so what is the shortest duration? Hmm. What is the shortest duration of time? Well, the answer is, how long does it take for a photon to cross a hydrogen molecule? This actually has been answered in Germany at the Petra 3 particle accelerator. How long does it take for a photon to cross a hydrogen molecule? It takes 247 zeptoseconds. And a zeptosecond is a zero followed by 20 more zeros, and that's it. So my, rec my recommendation is that estrogens, if they're prescribed, be prescribed for no more than 247 zeptoseconds. Now, what about bioidentical hormones? Um, you'll hear a lot of people who have been, they've gone to a well-meaning uh, practitioner who said, don't worry, I've got hormones that are better than the prescription ones. These are a match for your hormones in your body. Women, I'm sorry to have to say this, be skeptical of these because your own estrogens, the ones that your own body produces, increase breast cancer risk. Did you know that? This is true for all hormones. They're if you don't have enough of them, whether it's insulin or thyroid hormone or estrogen, that's not consistent with good health. But if you have too much of any of them, there are risks too. And here is what we see with estrogens and breast cancer. Nine prospective studies added together. And what we found is the more estrogen in your blood, specifically estradiol, the higher your risk for developing breast cancer. So if you go to a practitioner who says, I got bioidentical hormones, they're selling you something that's going to cause breast cancer in some way. It increases the risk just like any other. So that's why we're choosing more natural concern, uh, natural uh, uh, treatments. Okay, let me just briefly touch on something else. Uh, at menopause, this is a time when women have other things they're thinking about, other concerns, needless to say. So what if I'm gaining weight? I hear that now is the time when I might have a higher risk of heart disease or thinking more long-term dementia or breast cancer. What can I do about those risks? Let's just touch on each of them really, really quickly. Back in 2005, we looked at postmenopausal weight gain. We brought in 64 women. They were all after the age of menopause. They all had done Atkins, South Beach, Jenny Craig, Nutrisystem, you name it, they had done it. They all felt stuck. And we asked them instead to do a vegan diet or else a conventional diet. Let me explain what they were, but it was not an exercise study. And it was only 14 weeks in length. Very simple, very easy, very short. Um, and the vegan diet caused a weight loss of about 13 pounds. And the National Cholesterol Education Program, that's the control diet, only about an eight pound weight loss. Okay, vegan looking good, but that's only 14 weeks. We tracked them for a year after that and a year after that. So over a two year follow-up, the control diet led to only temporary weight loss. But the green line here, that's the vegans. And those of you who have been doing this yourself, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you lose weight and you just, there's no reason for it to ever come back. Why? Because you're not starving it off. You're not trying to power the weight off. You're making a qualitative shift in the way you eat. Your body hits a new equilibrium based on how much fiber and healthy foods is in your diet and based on getting away from the animal products and the fat and the junk. And when you've made that shift, your body takes it from there and it stays there. Okay, now wait a minute. That's our research. How about other people's research? Is this fair or did other people find the same thing or something different? Um, you may not um, be familiar with this. This is what we call a forest plot. If you're having trouble seeing the part on the right, just minimize the little photo strip. Um, those funny little black boxes, each one of those is a re research study. And on the far right, you see the zero line. If the black box is to the left of that zero line, that means the diet caused weight loss. And as you can see, every single one is to the left of that line. In other words, there was never a study that showed that a vegan diet didn't cause weight loss. It always does. Okay, very good. All right, so it really works. But how? Why do you lose weight by just sw swapping your meat chili for bean chili? Well, the first thing, is you're reducing energy density. And those of you who have followed Chef AJ, you know all about this. You're eating a lot of fiber and fiber fills you up without much of the way of calories. And you're eating less fat, more carbohydrate. You can say what you want to about carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is your big friend. That's right. 
It comes from an apple or a banana or a pear or a grape or some beans or some whole grains. And carbohydrate has only four calories in a gram, but fat, any kind of fat, has nine calories. All right, so a vegan diet has a lot of fiber to fill you up. It doesn't have much fat. It's got a lot of carbohydrate. People are going to lose weight naturally. Got it. And as a general rule of thumb, plant products really skip the fat unless you're adding it. Okay, good. Uh oh, wait a minute. Skip the cheese. Cheese is 70% fat. If you thought, well, maybe I'll be vegan except for cheese. If it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. Let me tell you something. Cheese is loaded with calories and loaded with fat. All right, but there's something else. It's not just the fact that you're eating not very calorie dense foods, but you get a better after meal calorie burn. And on our research team, Dr. Hanna Kaliova has been measuring the metabolism in many, many, many people. And what we've found is that everybody burns calories a little bit faster after a meal because you're absorbing the nutrients that you just ate. So you're gonna burn some calories. But if we measure your calorie burning speed carefully, what we discover is that after you've been on a completely plant-based diet for about 12 or 14 weeks, like call it three months, your after meal calorie burn is substantially, is significantly higher than it was before. Not, not a lot, but, but maybe call it 15% higher than it was before. What does that mean? That means that not only are you gonna lose weight because you're filling up sooner, the high fiber foods fill you up before you've had so many calories, but you're also burning off calories just a smidgen faster than all the other people around you who haven't yet adopted your healthy diet. You're burning calories a little bit more like you did when you were 16 years old, okay? So we actually brought in a huge number of people, 244 people, and we published this study late last year in JAMA Network Open, where we looked at what happens when you follow this diet and exactly what you thought happens happens, is that people lose weight and their after meal calorie burn goes way, way up. Okay. All right. So I want to lose weight. Plant-based diet's good to do. How about my, my heart? Oh, wait a minute. You know this already. You know about Dr. Dean Ornish's work. Back 30 years ago, Dean Ornish brought in people who had advanced heart disease. And what did he do? Did he give them Lipitor? I don't think so. What he did is he said, let's go vegetarian, almost vegan, half hour walk every day, manage stress, which is why he didn't do the study here in Washington, DC, where I live, and avoid tobacco. After a year, it was the most amazing result. Cholesterol, total cholesterol dropped 24%, but LDL, that's the bad cholesterol, dropped 37%. And the average person had lost 22 pounds, pretty good. But what really made headlines was the heart when they did an angiogram, which measures the tiny trickle of blood that gets through the coronary arteries to the heart muscle, the arteries were actually opening up so much that you could see a measurable reopening in 82% of the participants without any medicine, without surgery, no roto rooter, nothing. The arteries open up when you just get the junk out of your diet. In other words, the body has the capacity to heal. That's worth remembering. If you cut your skin, your skin's gonna heal. I mean, you don't think twice about it. You know it's gonna happen. It might leave a scar, but, but every skin cell in its DNA has the knowledge, if I can put it that way, or at least the game plan for finding other skin cells and closing that gap. Your bones have the capacity to heal. You break a bone, the cast doesn't heal you. It just holds the legs steady. The bones join together because they have that same owner's manual on how to heal again. If only your bones and only your skin could heal, the rest of you would fall apart and you'd be dead. But your arteries have the capacity to heal. Really? Yeah. If, if atherosclerosis has caused the deposition of cholesterol and fat and junk in your arteries, and you get away from all of that stuff, to a certain extent, your body can heal that and clear it away and allow the blood flow to get down to your heart. And if you're a man to your private parts, so your erectile dysfunction goes away. You've heard people talking about that. The blood flow can be restored to a very substantial degree, but it never will be. If just like picking a cut stops your skin from healing and, and having a loose cast so that the bones wiggle around keeps the bones from healing. And if you continue to eat chicken and fish and dairy products, which have cholesterol and animal fat in them, 
your arteries won't heal. But when we stop the insult, the body says, let me take it from here. Okay, brain health. This is for many people their biggest concern. You know, you don't really want to get Alzheimer's disease because when you do, you lose everything. Well, researchers in Chicago found that by studying people in large numbers, they could pick certain foods that were associated with dementia. And that gave us clues about what things we want to avoid. And it started off with foods high in saturated fat, bacon, meat, but that's the number two source of saturated fat. Number one, you guessed it, dairy products, cheese, there's a reason it's so creamy. It's loaded with all that bad saturated fat. So in Chicago, some people ate relatively little saturated fat, about 13 grams a day. Some people about double that amount, not 25 grams. And the risk of Alzheimer's disease was much lower than the people who avoided saturated fat. All right, chalk one up for going plant-based. Uh, but it's not just that. It's the trans fats in donuts. Same story. People who avoided them had much lower risk of Alzheimer's. And we've written a lot about this. I wrote a book called Power Foods for the Brain, where we're talking about all the steps people can do to protect the brain. But in a nutshell, it looks like prescription hormones increase the risk of dementia. A plant-based, low-fat, healthy diet reduces the risk of dementia. Yeah, okay. At Rush University in Chicago, researchers zeroed in on just one thing, and that's, are you eating your vegetables? They followed people for not quite five years, and these are the vegetable haters. These are the people who like their vegetables, and this is cognitive decline. The red line shows pretty steep decline in the people who did not like vegetables and didn't eat them. And the blue line is slower decline in the people who ate their vegetables. Now, here's my secret. What got them into the high vegetable group? Eating one serving of vegetables a day. That's it. This group, by having one serving of vegetable a day, had slower cognitive decline. Well, what if I have more than one? I think I could do better than this. Well, if I have one to two, it's the equivalent of being 11 years younger. So you can have three servings a day, you can have four, whatever. Knock yourself out. Add some fruits every now and then. Why not? Eat the plant-based foods. You're not just protecting your waistline, you're protecting your brain. Okay, and the last big concern is what about cancer? If we end up with breast cancer, uterine cancer, the other cancers later in life, you know, all bets are off. Well, uh, in the middle of last year, Gary Fraser's team at the Adventist Health Study 2 came out with a stunning report. They looked at more than 60,000 people. And what they found was that cow's milk has a surprising relationship with breast cancer. Look along the, the bottom here, look along that X axis. Do you see that? It's, goes from no cow's milk, that's on the left, and the halfway through about a quarter cup of cow's milk every day, then a half cup, a cup, two cups, four cups of cow's milk every day. And on the y-axis going up, that's your likelihood of getting breast cancer. In other words, if you have just a half a cup of cow's milk every day, your risk of breast cancer is substantially higher than if you avoid it. Now, when this research came out, everybody said, well, of course, I guess that's what we'd expect. Why would you expect that? Because in every dairy in America and the rest of the world, the cows are artificially inseminated every year. The reason they, they do that is that a cow doesn't make any milk unless the cow has been impregnated and gives birth. And if they are forced into this every single year, um, and, and of course there's all the ethical concerns of the, you're, you're right, the progeny are taken away, their calves, the male calves are killed for veal, the female calves, are gonna be raised in isolation until they're ready to have a, to get inseminated by, well, you know, um, and they're all killed by about age four instead of age 20, which is the natural lifespan of a cow. Um, aside from all of that, because they are milked during the pregnancy, and this happens every single year, estrogens get into the milk. So what am I saying? I'm saying that every single year on every dairy in the world, the cows are impregnated. They're pregnant nine months out of every 12. They're milked during much of their pregnancy. They make estradiol. The estradiol gets into the milk. The milk turns into ice cream. And you give your six-year-old son a bowl of ice cream. Or you give your nine-year-old daughter some cheese or some sour cream or a glass of milk. And they are consuming estradiol from the cow. 
Yep, that's right. And so now we believe that it's a driver for breast cancer, it's a driver for prostate cancer, and a driver for ovarian cancer, according to good research studies. Okay, so there it is. Um, as the pregnancy goes by, and uh, as the, the days of pregnancy go by, we see uh, the estrogen gets into the plasma, but especially into the milk. All right, there is no such thing as hormone-free milk. What about a woman who has had cancer in the past? Will milk affect her? Yeah. Uh, this was a study that came out uh, eight years ago, 2013. They looked at breast cancer patients, those who consumed the most high-fat dairy products, that's the red line, had uh, about a 50% higher risk of dying of their cancer compared to the women who avoided high-fat dairy. That's the, the green line. And what's having a lot of it? One serving a day. A woman with a previous diagnosis of breast cancer who has one serving a day of cheese or other high fat dairy has a 50% higher risk of dying of her cancer compared to the same woman if she avoided that. Okay, so by now, if, if you're new to this, if you hadn't met Chef AJ before and you hadn't heard about this before, you might be wondering, I like the idea of making a diet change, but I'm a little nervous about it. I don't know how I would do it. Let me share with you how we do it here. Here at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, we've had more than a thousand people participate in our research studies over the years, many more than that. And at the Barnard Medical Center, where we see patients either in person here or through, through telemedicine, uh, we help people to change their diets. And we use a special two-step method that I have never seen anyone unable to do. Here's what it is. First of all, we explain what a healthy diet is and it's fruits and grains and legumes and vegetables and take your vitamin B12. And so we're gonna also limit oils and that means avoiding the oils and the nuts and so forth. Now, don't get me wrong. Vegetable oils are a lot healthier for you than chicken fat. No question about it. Um, and there's nothing theoretically wrong with having nuts. I mean, they can be very uh, helpful. Same with avocado and guacamole. However, if you're trying to lose weight right now, and if you're trying to knock out hot flashes, just set these aside, even if they are healthier fats, set them aside for the moment and favor foods with about maybe three grams of fat or less per serving as you see on the label. And do look at the labels, you gotta check them out there. You're gonna see, oh yeah, 16 grams of fat in the peanut butter, oh my God. I would do better with black beans because they have less than a half a gram. Okay, all right, uh, do be careful. There's fats in all kinds of stuff. So, all right. Now, how am I gonna start this diet? You said there was a two-step method? Yeah, here it is. Step one, seven days. All we're gonna do is see which foods we might like. We're gonna scope it out. We're gonna check out the possibilities. Take a piece of paper, write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, and take seven days and fill out your list with plant-based foods that you actually like. And so you got seven days, you gotta try it. So what would that be? Well, in Your Body and Balance, I've got lots of great examples. These are from Lindsay S. Nixon, who's just a genius in the kitchen, um, but you're gonna find your own. There's lots of great choices. And let's say I normally have pancakes. Leave off the butter, leave out the eggs, and then milk. all right, that'll work. A uh, bowl of oatmeal with some sliced apples or bananas or some cinnamon or whatever. I always scramble eggs in the morning. I hear people scrambling tofu, but I'm a little afraid of tofu. All right, try it. If you don't like it, don't write it down. If you like it, have it. Tofu is one of these four letter words that people are kind of afraid of until they have it made the right way. And then you know what? People get addicted to tofu. They do. Give it a try, see what you think. Okay, then let's go on to lunches and dinners. I can have, instead of the hamburger I usually have, I guess I could try a veggie burger or whatever. All right, why not? I'll give it a try. And let's say you and I are gonna have dinner at an Italian place. I'll have a salad and the pasta fagioli or the lentil soup, and I'll have my pasta with the marinara sauce or the arrabbiata spicy sauce or the, well, how about that make me a pizza and just leave the cheese off, give me some extra sauce. All right, that'll work. Or we go Latin American with veggie fajitas and beans and rice and bean burrito. All right, this is starting to sound kind of appealing, isn't it? And Chinese restaurants, rice dishes, vegetable dishes, tofu dishes. Hey, let's go to the sushi bar, skip the fish sushi, but cucumber rolls, asparagus rolls, sweet potato rolls, they all work. Have the edamame if you want. Hey, have the seaweed salad, excellent source of iodine. Lots of great stuff. Now, Taco Bell is not the pinnacle of culinary art, but you will find that fast food chains have you covered kinda as well. 
the Taco Bell's got the bean burrito, you get a veggie sub at Subway or any place else, Chipotle, they've got a bowl for you. Wendy's, they'll give you a baked potato, you can get by. All right. So seven days have gone by, I got, I've got a pretty good list of things I actually like. That was step one. Now I got step two. Step two is let's eat those foods for three weeks. Oh, that's all? Let's eat. Wait a minute, I can do anything for three weeks and I already made my list. In fact, I stocked up on those foods. So here at Barnard Medical Center or at PCRM, we ask people to now just go vegan for three weeks. They find it extremely easy because they already planned out their list. And at the end of three weeks, two things happen. Number one, they are physically healthier. They're losing weight. Their digestion is better. They feel better. Their mood's better. If, they, if you have diabetes, your diabetes is getting better. If you've got hot flashes, it's starting to get better. For a lot of women, though, it takes a little longer than that, maybe five, six, seven weeks for the hot flashes to really start knocking down. But you'll see what I mean. And so if after three weeks, you're physically healthier, you might be surprised to notice one other thing. And that is that your attitudes about food are going in a really interesting direction. You find you don't really care so much about that greasy chicken wing anymore. And you haven't had cheese, but you sort of don't care. And you're finding new, exciting foods, recipes, websites, movies, friends who are all going in the same direction with you. So it's a cool thing to do. All right. Uh, just winding up in just for just a couple minutes, let me talk to you about actually making your soybeans if you want to give it a try. Here's what you do. It's not edamame. Those are the baby ones. You want the mature ones. They look like that. And you can order them. This is Laura soybeans, or you can, there are many brands. Uh, you'll find them on Amazon or anywhere else. They come shipped to you. And stick them in your Instant Pot, put them in the bottom, and have about two inches of water over the top. Leave some space. You don't want to blow the lid off the thing. Um, and pressure cook them for 40 minutes. Don't use the bean button on there. You do it manually, give it a good 40 minutes because I want to make sure they're really soft. They should come out like pine nuts. Now you can do it on your stove if you want. Soak them overnight and then rinse them in the morning and boil them for a good hour, hour and a half. They're gonna be nice and soft. Okay, great. Now, what do you do with them? Just have them plain or put them in a salad. Use them like pine nuts. Or extra credit, let's roast them. Yep, you can do it. You can buy them already roasted. They're called toasted. Um, these are from Laura Soybeans and you can buy them that way and they're super convenient. Uh, especially good if you're traveling. Like I got hot flashes, but I gotta go out of town. You could these, you put these in your luggage or do it yourself. This is what I do. Stick them in your Instant Pot, cook them just the normal way. Once they are done, coat a baking sheet with parchment. Uh, spread them out, but spread them thinly so that they're going to toast really well. Don't bunch them all up. And then bake them at 350 for a good hour. I wrote 45 to 60 minutes to tell you the truth. Cook them for 60 minutes. You want them nice and dry. And then you can season them however you want. You can make them salty. You can make them hot with, uh, with, with hot peppers. You can put garlic on there. You can put anything you want to. And if you feel like it, you can put those things on on the way into the oven and bake all the spices into them. Have fun with it, you're gonna really enjoy it. Okay, so you might be saying, okay, finally, I eat tofu, why, don't, why, is, why isn't that knocking out my hot flashes? Tofu is great, tofu is healthy, super versatile, but all of the soy products are lower in isoflavones than the actual mature soybeans. So you can do it with tofu, but you need to eat about eight ounces of it to get the same as you're gonna get whole soybeans. You can do it with soy milk, but you're gonna to have to eat two cups a day. So that's why we push the whole soybeans. Okay, this is my book, Your Body in Balance. I wanna just say, if you have a chance to pick it up at the library, please share it with somebody else because there are so many people out there who have menstrual pain or endometriosis or PCOS when they're young. And when they're approaching menopause, they got all the other things, hot flashes and all kinds of misery. And they never realized that foods could manipulate our hormones or their male friends have concerned about prostate cancer, erectile dysfunction. They've got thyroid conditions, they've got diabetes. And if we learn how to use foods to control our hormones, we can be a whole lot healthier. So I wanna just say a big thank you to the whole research team that has helped us do this work. And most of all, our research participants. And finally, a big thank you to you, AJ, for all the incredible work that you do every single day. You will never know how many people you inspire, but it is zillions. And when you do that, they tell other people about it and you are saving lives of people you have never even met.
Oh, thank you so much. Well, I, I take the lead from you, Dr. Barnard, because you work tirelessly. You remind me of Dr. McDougal. You send an email and before you push send, you've written back. It's incredible how you do that. I took some notes. This was an incredible presentation. And we have some wonderful comments like from Susan, who's saying she wished she had this information 25 years ago. She lived with her head in the freezer for five years. Yes, I feel her pain. There are so many women who've gone through exactly that. You know, it's just incredible that like you were talking about to change your, your gut. It's two weeks. That's not much time. I mean, people need to give this two weeks and they can feel better. Yeah, it's really true. And many people have thought that the gut microbiome is just sort of a fad thing that we talk about. But the fact of the matter is we all have bacteria in our digestive tract, like it or not, they're there. And some of them are healthy and some of them are not so healthy. And what really matters isn't so much whether you swallow a probiotic that you got at the store. It really is what is what are you eating so that if you got a lot of good, healthy fiber in your digestive tract and not a lot of fat, not a lot of junk, the healthy bacteria will survive. You know, um, a lot of people are watching and asking, a couple of people have soy allergies. Is there any way to get those powerful isoflavones in another form? Yeah, well, I guess the first thing is to make sure that you, it really is an allergy. If you got just a little gurgly stomach from, from it, that's not really an allergy. That just means that you're, you're not really used to eating soy. But if you got hives or you get respiratory symptoms or something, you are allergic and you've just got to skip the soy. Now, the good news is that there are isoflavones in other beans, pinto beans, black beans, they all have them, but the quantity is much lower than it is in the soybean. So that, that's the only reason that we're promoting the soy. Right. That, that was a, a slide you had at the very beginning. It was, I, I don't know if it was a green or a vegetable that I had never heard of before. Do oh, lechaya. La chai, la well, what is oh. that and where do you get it? You get it by um, going to rural Mexico. And I'm going to Mexico <laughs> today, actually. I leave today. Ask people about La Chaya. It's La, like the article L-A, Chaya, C-H-A-Y-A. -A. Okay. Um, and I don't know if it's everywhere in Mexico, but, but where, they, where it's really a big thing is on the Yucatan Peninsula, which is Cancun down to Tulum over by Valladolid, all that area. If you can find, get away from the hot dog shacks that have now come up and are cropping up everywhere, unfortunately, and look at the original traditional cuisine, La Chaya is like vegetable number one. Okay, I'm going to ask the gardener of the place that I'm going at Rancho La Puerta because I've never heard that and I'd love to try it. Gina, who's watching live, asks if menopause can cause somebody to become hypothyroid. Menopause itself won't cause hypothyroidism. However, for many women at the time of menopause, when you go see your doctor and your doctor will say, how are you feeling? And you say, well, I'm gaining a little bit of weight and I'm feeling kind of sluggish. And you know, doc, I looked in the mirror and I just don't look so healthy. My hair isn't healthy. My skin doesn't look so healthy. And these sound like vague symptoms to most of us, but to a doctor, a doctor says, okay, I'm connecting the dots. Let me do a blood test. The doctor tests you for hypothyroidism with a test called TSH. Um, and many, many, many women are low in, uh, they're not making a normal amount of thyroid hormone. In fact, in your body and balance, let me just mention, I have a whole chapter devoted to that exact issue, but to make it just real short and sweet. Can I just kind of give my two-step solution? Here? Oh, no, we have played for you. And okay. all, uh, <laughs> all right, just real quick. The, the first thing is your thyroid gland. Th this is Clark Kent. It's this, like nobody pays any attention to this little thyroid gland, but inside it is Superman because it gives you energy and it keeps you healthy. But you know what? It cannot make thyroid hormone at all, zero, without iodine. And iodized salt gives people iodine. However, because nowadays we're avoid, generally avoiding salt, and, and let me tell you, for good reason, I mean, it's a good idea to get away from salt. People are kind of losing their source of, of iodine. And the people who do perfectly fine are people who grew up in Japan because they're eating seaweed and seaweed is loaded with iodine. It's got all you could ever want. So if you're avoiding the iodized salt and not eating seaweed, you might want to consider a supplement. Now your doctor can test you and will know very easily if you're low in iodine or not. If you're taking a supplement, you need about 150 micrograms a day, very small amount, and your doctor can manage you. The other thing though, is this is another really good reason for a completely vegan diet. The Adventist Health Study 2 found that people following meaty diets and high dairy diets are at higher risk of hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. And the people who follow vegan diets, lowest risk of each. Now I have to say, Nobody has done a randomized controlled trial. 
yet to see if a person who is hypothyroid and goes on a vegan diet, can they get off their medicine? Nobody has done that, that trial in a careful way. But a lot of people have done that trial at home where they just say, I'm just going to give it a try. I'm not going to wait for it to come out in the journal. And you'll read their stories in your body and balance. There's a lot of people who have been able to reduce their medicines or get off them completely. Don't, don't cancel your medical appointment. Don't throw your pills away. Talk with your doctor, let your doctor know, hey, I'm going to give it a try and see what happens and say, doc, monitor me and see how I do as I make this dietary transition. There's never a reason not to do it. And a lot of people do great with it. And yeah, I, I was listening to some of those stories on your PCRM podcast, and we actually have someone watching live, a different Gina, that said she was actually in that study, and what a change. Oh, that's fantastic. Great, great. Well, my gratitude uh, to all of our research participants for being part of this work. That is so cool. So we actually had somebody named uh, Morgan write in a question for you saying, hi, Dr. Barnard. I am... 44 years old, I'd like to talk about perimenopause. My cycle length has become very unpredictable, can range from 17 to 40 days. Most difficult is the extreme mood swings in the final days, crying at the drop of a hat or anger, turned into a roller coaster for myself and everyone who lives with me. I switched to a whole food plant-based diet three three years ago, lost 30 pounds. My BMI is 24. I'm oil-free, but not salt and sugar-free. I have decreased my caffeine intake. Can there be relief? So what else should Morgan be doing? Okay. Well, you, first of all, um, I'm sorry to hear that you're dealing with these issues. You know, from in a textbook situation, your cycle length would be about 28 days. It would come and go, be totally predictable. And you're saying, wait, mine's completely unpredictable. I can't tell what the length is going to be. And I can't really tell how I'm going to feel from day to day. I'm on a roller coaster. It's driving me crazy. Um, I'm sorry to hear you have to go with that. But the good news is, is that you're already doing some of the things that we would always recommend. Getting away from, from animal products completely is really job one, because when we do that, we're getting away from the, ex, the external uh, estrogens that can come into the system. Because what, what you're experiencing is you're experiencing is your estrogen levels will rise and then they suddenly fall and that can cause problems. But when you have too much estrogen in the system, it causes the uterine lining, the lining of your uterus to thicken up too much and then that makes maladaptive chemicals called prostaglandins that make you feel crummy. And that's the reason that you feel crummy. It's just too much estrogen happening. So avoiding the animal products, job one. Keeping oils scrupulously low is job two. But let me add one more thing. If you're avoiding added oils, but you're consuming a lot of natural oils, let me encourage you to do an experiment. For example, let's say you're having almonds and and um, avocados and these, and, and these things. And you're absolutely right that those are natural, healthy oils. But in your body, they might be causing you to make a little bit too much estrogen. Take two cycles, two months, and do it not only vegan, not only oil-free, but skip the nuts, nut butters, and the avocados. So, so now there's not much of any kind of fat in your diet. You're just doing this as a test. You don't have to decide, I'm gonna live with this forever. Just do it as a test and see if you don't feel on a more even keel. Um, start it from day one of one cycle to day one of the next cycle, and then do it another cycle after that, maybe three, and you'll, you'll get a good test and you'll, and you'll see. So even if somebody's following a very healthy vegan diet, can being overweight, that, that, that's not good for this particular condition, correct? Sure. Um, because what does weight do? Body, body fat isn't just a bag of calories. Body fat is an active factory. Each fat cell makes estrogens in women and also in men. So if a man has, say, a little bit of breast enhancement, that's not because he was eating tofu, um, that is, which is what he read on the internet. Um, that's because his body fat is making estrogens that are, that are causing, well, they're taking his testosterone and converting it into estrogen. And that's his problem. Wow. So, you know, I, I love when you said in your talk that in, in Asia, they eat largely plants. And is there, is, is it a coincidence that they also have the lowest obesity rate? No, it's, it's, these things go exactly together. Um, in probably the, called the 1960s, early 70s, Japan had the slimmest, healthiest, longest lived population on earth. It wasn't completely vegan, but it was close to it. There was really no dairy in the diet, not much meat, huge amounts of rice and vegetables. And then as time went on, as they westernized and they were decreasing the plants in the diet and increasing the meat and the dairy, especially, 
their longevity became lower, their waistline expanded, hot flashes became more common, uh, diabetes became more common, heart disease became more common, breast cancer rates doubled. Um, all of these problems come in. So a plant-based diet is, is part of being, uh, and I don't mean just slim, I mean a healthy weight um, and also a healthy body. Wow. You know, that's, that's so interesting. So Jennifer, who's watching, she says she's an identical twin. She's 52 years old and both her and her sister follow a whole food plant-based diet. Jennifer has no symptoms, but her sister who drinks coffee and alcohol has lots of symptoms. Do either of those two substances play a role? Yeah, um, they can. If you're talking about vasomotor symptoms of menopause, um, in the research studies that we have done, which, which are limited, but we've, we've been studying this now for, for a, a little bit. We do find that alcohol is a really, <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, a, a, really, a really good hot flash trigger. Um, so many of our women will say it was a, a, a busy day at work. I got home, I poured myself a glass of wine and it was practically that first sip of wine when it passed my lips, bingo, the hot flash kicked in. So that's very commonly reported, I'm sorry to say. But you'll know, I mean, you'll, you'll know your body. Um, give yourself some time away from these things and then challenge yourself with them and you can, you can, you can see. Yeah, what about, about what about caffeine? Things like coffee, can that play a role? Yeah, I think it can. And, and not just the caffeine, but also what is in it. You know, you go to the store and you get a latte. Um, there is some coffee in there, there's, but there's a whole lot of milk in there. Um, there's a whole lot of other stuff. So sometimes the creamers are worse than, than uh, the coffee itself. But, but caffeine, you can see if it's a trigger for you. For some people, it can't be. Right. And Karen's saying, could natto work in addition to soybeans or instead of? It's practices it, fermented soybeans. Yeah, um, in theory, it could. It's, it really is a question of how long the soybean has been on the vine. Um, if it has had a good chance to mature, um, then it's producing more isoflavones. So yeah, the whole, you're, you're thinking right. The, the whole big soybean um, that has, that is mature is a pretty good source of uh, isoflavones. Right. And people are asking if they follow this protocol, I'm encouraging everyone to get your book, Body and Balance, could they go off their HRT? Well, first of all, yes, the answer is absolutely. And secondly, you can go off your HRT before my book arrives in the mail. Um, <laughs> you, you, you do not have, they, they would, there is, you're not on HRT to save your life. Um, the HRT is there because it just makes you temporarily feel better. For a lot of women, once they stop, their, you know, their hot flashes will resume. And, and it's, the, the, your doctor does not want you to be on HRT for very long because your doctor feels like he or she is gonna, gonna be you know, put in a noose pretty soon because the patients are going to end up with breast cancer or, or heart disease. And so doctors don't want to use HRT for a very long period of time. So every patient can get off of it. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to try the system that I'm, I'm describing and, and just see what works for you. Right. Dr. Barner, I think it's just, let's not wait another year to have you back, please. You're just, you're just phenomenal. Oh, well, thank you, AJ. It's fun to talk to you again. And, uh, Thank you for allowing me to share some time with you and with your audience. Anytime. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have registered dietitian, David Goldman, who worked on the film Game Changer. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnard. Be well. Great. Thank you, AJ.